Good afternoon. I now call to order the May 19th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and Offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, Today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Gover if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Gover, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Ms. Hen, I believe um, Ms. Bean is on the line. Yes, I am. I was having technical difficulties as well. I apologize. Oh, thank you, Ms. Um, Gover, and thank you, Ms. Bean. Sorry about that. Um, okay, Ms. Hen. Present. Ms. Pasture. Present. Ms. Joes. Ms. Mack. Present. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bean. Would you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Yes, Dr. Brian Scriven. Mr. George Saris and Mr. Whit Tantleff. Present. Is Thank there, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any additional staff participating that were not mentioned? No. Thank you, Ms. Bean. The first item on the agenda is the Budget Committee vision, mission, and goals. At the February 23rd, 2021 board meeting, the board voted to establish a standing budget committee to provide year round focus on allocating resources equitably for all students. A draft of the committee's vision, mission and goals developed jointly with Vice Chair Mrs. Cheryl Pasture was shared with the committee as an information item on the committee's April 21st agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the budget committee's vision, mission and goals as proposed? So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. Do I have a second? I'll second. Roger Thank McMillian. You. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. It is moved and seconded that the Budget Committee's vision, mission, and goals are adopted. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of adopting the committee's vision, mission, and goals as proposed, please answer yes when your name is called. All opposed, please answer no. If you're not ready to vote, answer pass and you will be called on again after the roll has been completely called. Ms. Bean, would you please call the roll? Ms. Jose. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. With four in favor and zero opposed, the motion carries. The Budget Committee vision, mission, and goals are adopted as proposed. Thank you all. I now present Mr. Witt Tantliff to provide a review of the board's financial report. Hi, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, hi. Um, in board docs, uh, there's a report you may have or may not have seen before, but it's the uh, financial report we put out this year. So 
Um, what we wanted to do today was to show you, in case you hadn't ever looked at it in uh, much detail, we wanted to show you the report uh, that existed. And this goes back to when Ms. Hen and I were uh, had our first discussion on the budget committee. Uh, she had mentioned, uh, you know, could a report be developed? What was out there? So uh, we agreed the first step would be to review what already exists and then uh, we could decide if there was some other um, need that still needed to be addressed. So I will go ahead and um, attempt to share my screen. I don't know if, uh, yeah, it looks like it's okay. Sometimes on the board meetings, it doesn't uh, work right, but it looks like it's fine. All right. All right, everyone, so what I'll do is just kind of roll through the report and describe what's there. Uh, if you want to see a bigger copy, you know, feel free to open it up from board docs into your uh, PC and you can make it, uh, it might, uh, I can blow it up a little or can you guys see it okay? If you could enlarge it a little, Mr. Tantliff, that would be helpful. How's, how's that? That's better, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, so this this report uh, starts in September, and unfortunately due to the ransomware, that is the only report you've received this year, but uh, normally you would be getting this every month, and hopefully it'll be, ever, be over the hump for ransomware uh, very soon, and there'll be no issues in FY22. Uh, but basically this report um, gives some overviews and then goes by activities and talks about the expenditures and how we're trending year to date versus last year. Um, so I want to just go through the report, uh, show you what's there, and then um, board members can ask questions. So uh, the first section is revenue. Um, and again, this would look a lot different as the year goes on. Uh, this is the this is the adopted revenue. So this is just comparing this year to last year. But uh, we get into the year to date comparison and I'm not going to go through all the details. I just want to give you a feel for what's in it. So it just gives you some kind of um, key metric points. So the county appropriations, 52 percent of revenue and how much it increased, how much the percent is over the budget. Um, it talk, gives you a little bit of background on how they draw county fund and how much has been recognized year to date. Now, particularly with revenue, most of our revenue, almost all of our revenue is, you know, if you want to call it guaranteed. Um, so our county, federal and state revenue uh, all comes in in increments, either, uh, most of it every other month. Uh, so the amount year to date or the amount we've received so far really is not normally a concern. We, we wouldn't normally have any kind of cash flow issue. Um, so we talk about the county, our local revenue, and uh, the term that probably rings a bell with you is the maintenance of effort on the county revenue. We talk about that a lot in the budget meetings. Then we talk about our state of Maryland revenue. And I think everyone here knows this, but the percent of budget funded by the state versus the county can vary pretty significantly based on the state, based on your wealth factor, based on uh, the number of free and reduced children, et cetera. So whereas we're kind of close to 50-50, you know, Maryland's 45%. If you looked in Baltimore City, the state's uh, about 80% of the revenue. So it varies, it's across the board, across the state, and that'll all start changing in the coming decade because of blueprint, at least the percentage funded by the state versus county, the mix will start to look a little different. So this just talks about um, budgeted state revenue, how much we've received so far, um, and just gives a couple of key points about the revenue that's budgeted this year. Items that you may or may not remember, but 
probably were touched on some point throughout the year during the budget process. Uh, federal revenue, this is just the general fund we're talking about. Um, so for us, we have very little revenue. It's just the ROTC budget that is in the general fund. Almost all federal revenue is our special revenue, historically Title I and our IDA special ed pass-through grant are our primary drivers. But of course, the CARES grant now is dwarfing everything else in the special revenue and that will step up big time next year as um, the ARP funding starts coming through. And then here we just talk about other revenue that we get. Some of it's um, out of county living. That's pretty significant. There's some small buckets we get um, and 31.3 million of it, which is what we've had the last couple of years and what we budgeted next year is our fund balance being reused so uh, um, as a reminder, everything we underspend at the end of the year, we are not allowed to retain. We turn it back over to the county and um, they, they could grab it all if they want, but they've always kind of set it aside for us and they've reused it. So uh, the majority of it becomes a funding source for the following year. So we just talk about just how we kind of compared a year ago. Um, here's the budget by category or activity. And activity, if you'll recall, is, is really the key thing that the board is approving. You're approving by activity. And when we do the budget appropriation transfer, which I know gets a lot of discussion, the BAT, that only deals with net dollars between activities because by statute or really by by comar um, we cannot overspend any activity and so the board has to approve increases or decreases in any activity versus the adopted budget um, so then we have uh, we're on page three now hold on Sorry, cat got trapped. <laughs> um, so this just tells us about our year-to-date expenditures and how that compared to a year ago. Um, so sometimes it's smooth, you know, payroll year versus year is pretty steady. Um, it might just go up based on COLA, steps, payroll increasing. Uh, but there's other things that could be volatile because we make a big payment early in the year. So sometimes you'll see um, different uh, categories. Uh, the percent expended might be significantly higher or lower than a year ago. And that's not necessarily um, an area of concern as long as we understand what it is and it was planned uh, to be spent that way. So if you just glance through this and, and there's a lot of uh, details there, it's just this is just still the overview before we get into the activities, talking at a high level about expenditures. Talks about significant expenditures that are both budgeted and expended uh, throughout the year. And here you can see um, Early in the year, we had encumbered money a little earlier in the year in transportation, so that drove an increase, but we'll, we'll actually underspend contract buses this year because for three quarters of the year, um, we were not really using contract bus expense, but the money still got encumbered. So at that point in the year, the expend rate looked um, a little higher and also our um, retiree health benefits or OPEB in this year, FY21, increased by 7.3 million versus the prior year. So again, those were incremental expenditures that'll make the spend rate um, look like it's uh, significantly higher than a year ago, but it's not necessarily an area of concern because all that money was budgeted. And again, we're still high level. Now we're just focusing on salaries because it's such a big part of the budget um, and the budget included 10.1 million for increased compensation. That was really the only increased compensation this year that was budgeted was the 1% call of, again, 
sometimes I confuse myself. This year becomes FY. Is it this year or next year? Because we're talking about the current, you know, FY 22, because we're so heavy into the budget. But this year in this case is we're only talking about FY 21. So this just talks about some high level budgeting uh, things to be aware of that uh, make the budget look different than the prior year. Um, and this is showing, and you can see on the bars, FY20 in green, FY21 in blue, by activity, what percent was obligated by September 30th. And you can see, I mean, the trends are pretty similar um, for the most part, but sometimes there is some volatility, but again, none of these are, and let's just forget about ransomware, None of these are a concern because we're normally uh, tightly projecting expenses. People are not overspending their budget, so the timing is not really that important. Um, I just want to go up for a second. OK. Um, here in activity two, we talk about, or this is really activity one and two. I, you all don't really need to be concerned with those numbers, but that's administration, which we talk about a lot, and mid-level administration. Um, administration talks about senior staff, but it mostly talks about uh, human resources, payroll, purchasing, um, administrative positions. That's the bread and butter and what most of the dollars are in administration. Um, there's IT expenses in there, but uh, the executive director and above group is uh, a fairly modest percent of the administration category. And mid-level um, deals with office of the principal, so it's mostly APs, principals, and the expenses associated with their office. You could have a copier there, you could have supplies. Um, but people associated with their office, most of it's in the schools, but there is a fair amount of these positions also in CNI. Um, instructional salaries, uh, really that's our biggest bucket and that is most of our paras and teach, well, all of our paras and teachers are in instructional salaries as well as some other positions. Um, instructional textbooks and supplies. And, and in each one of these, um, it, it really, and it's early in the year, so there wasn't as much activity as you'd see. Uh, and maybe I should have brought a report from later in the year, and we, we could look at that if you want to. But the gist of it is this, we go through each activity and we talk about large expenditures and how the expenditures compared a year ago. So we have instructional textbooks, other instructional, costs, all the leasing goes in other instructional costs. So a lot of over the year, the initiative previously known as STAT, that's where most of the dollars sat. Whereas if you buy a PC, that becomes an instructional supply or activity four. Uh, special education, I think uh, that's self-explanatory. So it's all of our special education teachers it's our non-public placement budget. It's um, parent reimbursements or legal settlements and a variety of other special ed related non-salary expenditures. Student personnel and health services, a fairly uh, small part of our budget. Um, transportation, it's all the drivers, contract buses, um, and a lot of their related expenditures. Uh, operation of plant is uh, grounds and upkeeps and, and just, gr I mean, grounds, upkeep. Um, so it's custodians, people mowing the lawn. Um, it includes gas and electric. Uh, what I wanted to mention is um, Maintenance of plant also includes the transportation mechanic. So it's all the mechanics that work in the schoolhouse, but a transportation mechanic, the bus mechanics would also be in here. They're not actually in the transportation category. Fixed charges uh, is almost all 
benefits. Most of it is central, centrally planned. Um, and that all hits in one area. So it's health, it's the uh, OPEB that we mentioned earlier, which is the employee retiree benefits, it's pension costs, et cetera. And then uh, COVID issues is just something, a uh, blurb that got added into this report because it's uh, such an impactful thing that's going on through the system. So just a few words about that. Historically, you, you wouldn't have this uh, piece, but you might have something else that's sort of special. And that's really the guts of the report. Um, then we get into just some tables. So what you can see here is each of the categories we talked about, like administration, mid-level administration, instruction, it's the breakdown in salary versus non-salary. Um, FY20 versus FY21, adopted budget, uh, total received to date, remaining budget and the percent um, earned or obligated. So um, for revenue, it's how much we've received to date. For the expenditure buckets, it's how much we have spent to date. So, um, and you can, it, this is a nice little table in that you can really quickly see how we've changed from year to year. Um, in terms of the budget, which I know is a curi you know, something you're curious about a lot. So this is sort of a handy guide just to compare each of the activities, salary and non-salary from year to year. Um, and that's really the key part of the report. Uh, we had this financial uh, report on special revenue. This is not, um, always in the report, but this is mostly talking about grant funds. And I think because it was such a hot topic, um, we added some detail about grant funds uh, this year. And then we also gave a summary of some capital construction projects. So uh, you all received this, uh, but I realize you certainly may not have looked at it in detail earlier in the year. I think it was the second November board meeting. This was through September. So it, you know, it takes several weeks to close the books. That's why we can't, you know, produce it a week or two after the month. It ends up being about, you'll get this normally about six weeks after the month closes because it's at least three weeks till the books are closed. And then we need to put the report together, QA things, and then based on the timing of the board meeting, you know, it might be five or six report weeks after the month ends. So that's kind of it uh, in a snapshot, the monthly report that the board receives now. Is there um, any questions or anything you'd like me to scroll back to? Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. This was very helpful. Um, I'll get us started. I have a few questions and then I'll turn it over to committee members if that's OK with everyone. Great, thank you. My first question, you mentioned that the state county split is determined by a number of um, items and that that's different by county, which, which makes sense or by jurisdiction. How often is that determined? And you mentioned specifically that one of those um, criterion is the farms rate. Can you speak to that and whether, or, or if the implementation of CEP had any effect on the state county split determination um, now that we're not tracking farms rates for those schools uh, uh sure so i know that's a lot sorry well it, no that's okay L let me take a step back and 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 explain so let's put blueprint aside because that's just we're just nibbling at that right now so we're still basically dealing with the thornton or bridge to excellence formula that's been in place since I think 2002. And actually that uh, formula will still exist. It will just be somewhat altered and enhanced by Blueprint. So there's not, there's not someone saying, 
you're going to, this is your split between county and state. There's sort of two independent things that are happening. So on the county side, and when they redid all the formulas almost 20 years ago, they took a lot of factors into account. Um, and maybe um, since we'll still have some time, uh, you might find it interesting. I can pop over to the state aid formula from MSDE and you can see each grant and how it's developed. It's not a grant in the special revenue. It's a grant as in it's a component of the state general fund revenue stream. So first on the county, um, we're all familiar with maintenance of effort. So basically county funding in the few in all the past years has been determined by how much you spent per child per eligible student last year multiplied by the number of eligible students you have this year on September 30th. So, um, uh, and by eligible, it's, it's not that important because it's consistent, but like a pre-K student is not an eligible student. So that knocks, so you'll see a difference of, you know, probably four or 5,000 children between the number we talk about for enrollment and the number of eligible students that MSDE funds us on. And it's not that the kids are any less uh, valuable per se, it's just that, again, take the pre-K bucket, it's implied that the pre-K funding is covered by all the other buckets that we're getting. You know, So once we put everything together, that covers your pre-K. But back when they determined the formula, those were not considered those were not eligible students. So the county funding, uh, you look at last year's funding per student, you multiply it by the number of students September 30th. So let's, uh, again, let's forget COVID for a second because this year it was a little different and that was driven by Kierwin because this year was so weird because you know we lost 4,000 students. <coughs> But if you took the September 30th, 2020 enrollment times the dollar per student from the year before, which would have been FY20, that determines our funding for FY22. So that always, even amongst ourselves, that can become a confusing um, concept. But think of it this way, our enrollment this year drives our funding next year and that'll still be true with blueprint and kirwin and if you think about it it's the only thing that you can do now if you're growing you're sort of playing catch up the whole time and so we've had an, a good decade of growth until this year we were growing you know on average a little over a thousand kids a year so we were always if you think in a way being underfunded because we were growing next year but the funding was based on this year and there'd be no way to do it next year if you think about it because we can't budget uh we need to budget this year and we need to have known funding and so the only realistic way to do it is to do it a year in arrears i guess if the state wanted to they could do some sort of true up or something like that but that would be confusing and i guess it could help you in years that you had reduced enrollment which we haven't had lately but um you know anything could happen but in any case, that's the law and that's the way it's determined. So our September 30th enrollment of this year, which was 2020, would normally have determined our funding for 2022, which is a year later, if that makes sense. So that's how the that's how the county funding is calculated completely independently of the state funding. Then the state funding is a very complicated formula. There's, um, I think, eight independent grants within that. And there's some, and, and we have a really nice model we've built to try to estimate what that's gonna be going into the year, but there's no way to get it right because your tax base, your whole wealth is a big driver in some of the formulas. And there's no way for us to do that. We can just look at trends and this and that, but it's literally your assessed um, value of the property in the county. Um, it looks at number of kids being transported. It looks at number of special education kids you have. It looks at number of ESOL kids you have. It looks at the number of free and reduced children you have. So I, I don't think we had any impact um, this year 
from CEP because we, we really couldn't implement the program. And, and our, um, well, it's really for next year, our free and reduced percentage is up significantly just because of all the changes externally. Um, so that, you know, in the future, there, there are um, some impacts from CEP that uh, in theor theoretically could impact the compensatory education grant. That's the one that you're free and reduced um, are driven by. Uh, so I'd be happy to, if you want, to pop over the state aid document and in, in five minutes, it'll maybe gel it for you in your mind what's, you know, I know a little hard to follow when I'm just describing what it means. Um, so if you'd like, I can do that or not, whatever <laughs> members Thank would prefer. Thank you. And there's a really nice overview of um, state and county Sor fund funding sources in the budget book. If committee members haven't seen that, I would suggest checking that out. But your explanation is gold, Mr. Tantliff. So thank you for connecting the dots sure. for me there. Um, it sounds as if the, the state portion is variable, whereas the county is largely, I'll say fixed, but based on enrollment. Is that a the, true the statement? Count. Yeah, the, the, the per pupil is based on the prior year, prior year, so it's stable, but when we get funded above maintenance of effort, that will make the per pupil go up. Times your new number of children. Um, so like last year in FY21, our budget was right at maintenance of effort. So the, the dollars per student didn't change. The only variable is the number of students. Now, uh, one thing that ended up being lucky for us and really it's true for everyone across the state and we anticipated that this would happen but in um and so kirwin is hb 1300 you may hear that number sometime and the kirwin supplement is hb 1372 that was the bill that got 1372 got 1300 was passed last year and vetoed by governor hogan when 1300 got overridden this year, they added a complementary bill called HB 1372, which then it took into account the timing delay of implementation. It took into account the enrollment drops during COVID. And, you know, it just it was just new thinking that they had got thrown in there, too. So, um, you know, they were they were uh, refreshing the bill for new knowledge a year later, you know, Ms. Pester, maybe you could uh, second that, but that's basically what they did with 1372. <laughs> that's what they did with 1372. But what they did for maintenance of effort in normally historic times, if your enrollment went down, your maintenance of effort would go down because it's based on the number of kids. There were the last few years they like Baltimore City in particular, but also a couple of the smaller counties uh, were losing students like Baltimore City was losing students pretty rapidly. They've got they were losing like a thousand kids a year. So they had uh, passed a new. Um, uh, it wasn't hold harmless, but it slowed down how fast their funding would reduce because the state funding is primarily driven by kids also. It's just that there's no, number of kids is your number one driver, but then there's all these other factors. Um, and it's not that variable, um, but there is there is a lot of stuff going on in there. And the determination of those formulas 18 years ago is really when I circle back to your original question, that's what really drove how much state funding you were going to get. It, it was the components of this formula. And so the formula, because of Baltimore City situation, lower assessed values, more poor children, that ended up driving up their percent of funding that was uh, derived by the state. Um, whereas Montgomery County, the wealthiest county in the state, uh, they I don't know the exact percent off the top of my head, but they might be only um, 30 percent funded, 30 to 35 percent funded by the state. And, you know, that all makes sense, right? They're a wealthier county. So the metrics that drive increase and they're going to have a much higher assessed tax base. So the things that drive the formula. From the state 
to go down, they would be, you know, the case on the low end, whereas Baltimore City would be the case on the high end. Thank you. And I have one more question, but in the interest of time, feel free to respond in writing to this one because it's it's about reporting in general. Um, yeah. So I, I want to make sure committee members have um, ample time for their questions as well. Um, this report is very helpful at seeing at an activity level um, expenditures across um, categories or I think you're using categories and activities interchangeably. Is that am I using the correct terminology yeah. across yeah. categories? And those are standard um, for reporting you know, statewide. Um, when board members talk about the budget, we tend to be focused on department budgets and looking at whether our departments are adequately funded um, and are interested in those expenditures, which can be difficult because for many departments, those are spread across categories. Um, transportation, you mentioned the example of bus mechanics. Um, IT is within a number of categories, administration, c &I, it's I think all over the place. Is there a report or could we be provided a report that allows us to get a snapshot of spending by department periodically through the year so that we can see if those departments are adequately funded? For instance, if there's a project that we want, um, that IT wants to do and they run into a, a cost overrun, but they're realizing that they don't have the resources to do it. That's something that the board should be aware of when, and especially when we consider a proposed budget to say, you know what, we're consistently having greater needs than we have resources and maybe we want to consider funding them at a higher level. Um, that Those kinds of insights aren't often shared, or at least I haven't seen those outside of discussion at budget time. And I would like us to take a more proactive approach so that we're not finding out, oh, this project didn't go forward because we ran out of money. Um, so while I, I understand that at a high level, we're looking at categories, some of the types of decisions we make at budget time are really department centric, project centric, and it's hard to be able to glean those insights from a category level report. Um, so I would need to discuss that with uh, Mr. Saris. Um, and I'd need to understand, I, I totally hear everything you said, but um, you know, if it just gets so granular, like potentially you're describing, it gets into that. Are we really, as board members, is that just too far into the operational weeds of the office? If you're looking at the office budget, and it, you know, because we're the superintendents making decisions if a project should go forward or not, um, if it's going to, um, if he needs to, if we need to shift money around, and then that all manifests itself in the bat at the end of the year or in April or March, April, so where you get to see all that. I, I just don't know if it would be an all consuming task to provide very, very granular detail. And I totally understand the ask and the interest, um, but it, it just may be a lot to bite off. Sure, and, and I'll, cut to kind of the end goal with the bat since you brought up the bat that's a perfect example of when this comes up um, that often comes as a surprise and one particular example is with transportation since I've been on the board there have been frequent um, reallocations from transportation to other areas partly because we have difficulties finding bus drivers or <coughs> even contract services sometimes and while it's an operational issue, it's a concern to the community that we have this need in transportation. Um, so those are the types of insights, and it wouldn't necessarily need to be provided at a granular level, but more of these are our challenges. This is what was budgeted prior to prior to getting the bat. This mm -hmm. is this is our um, tracking more of an exception report to say we budgeted X for transportation. We're not finding drivers, so how do we do that? Do we increase driver pay? Those are some of the types of decisions that 
as a board member, I would like more insight into prior to receiving the bat. So I don't need to be in the weeds looking at, you know, did fiscal overspend, you know, on copy paper. That That's not what I'm talking about. More of an exception basis to say, here's where there's a, a variance, a significant variance that the board needs to be aware of. Um, one one thing uh, George and I have discussed as a potential solution to what you're describing is uh, the bat, the budget appropriation transfer at the end of the year is the sum essentially of the budget line transfers throughout the year that the offices are doing. Um, we uh, we were thinking uh, one potential. Uh, way to address what you're asking about is we could, we'll have to think about the best way so it's not overwhelming, but we could potentially produce the budget line transfers with a description of what they were for. Maybe it's not every month, maybe we do it every other month, but uh, we could summarize the impact on the overall budget. So that would be by activity, but you could see what you adopted versus what the in progress budget is. And then ultimately after the bat, um, that's your that's our final budget, but it would show you the changes that have occurred from month to month. And the line items would be the explanation. Now the sum of the line items are not going to exactly equal the bat because what we have to do at the end of the year is we need to give ourselves a cushion. Right. So if we're right on track to spend on that activity and we think we're going to be 100,000 under, we, we're, we're going to move a million dollars into there. Because, so wait, yes. why, don't, why, don't we, why don't we come up with a schedule that, that we build that into, I, I think we need to come up with a calendar. So for this budget committee, I think we need to come up with a year and a glance calendar where we map out in advance what some of those look fors are that you guys want to see that's budgetary related and we can meet that need. Um, Chair Hemp, what, what I want to be cautious of though is, and I, I'm, I'm going to be transparent, this is a small group, so please re receive my transparency. I, um, we recognize what the issues are in transportation. Let me say that. I clearly recognize what, what they are. Um, we'll, we'll be giving you guys another update. Uh, I believe it's going to be in July uh, around transportation, which will be a full presentation. But things with salary, et cetera, that I'm going to elevate um, or, or reactivate that uh, transportation action group again. And there's some other pieces that we're going to activate. Right now, we're doing a full um, uh, inquiry around ask me holistically, not just transportation as it relates to salary. So uh, we, we can keep you updated on those pieces, but I want to keep the budget as the budget to keep you informed without crossing too far into operations. I, I just want to be honest. Sure. Thank okay. you, Dr. Scriven. Okay. And I, I specifically didn't want to use transportation as an example because I don't want to pick on transportation. No, but no. So, as I mean, an example of the bat, right. um, what Mr. Tantliff described, more frequent updates about yeah. what to expect on the bat would be helpful. Just well, with well, one way, notes. Can you guys, as a, as a collective group, um, just come up with what you would like to see? Um, and, and then we can build that into a, a, like I said, a year and a glance calendar where we can make sure that we stay ahead of making sure that we're meeting the need and the expectation of this committee. We're, we're more than, than willing um, to do it, but it, it would be good for us to have it in advance so we can just plan out for it. But I'm, I'm, I'm all for supporting however uh, we need to. Thank you, absolutely. And I'm going to turn it back over to the committee in, in a second. Um, before um, you joined, we did adopt committee a vision, our mission and goals. Okay. So I would like to meet with Vice Chair Pasteur. And now that those are adopted, 
um, we have a framework for developing that year in advance schedule as you described. So I think we're in a good good position to be able to do that. All right, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Committee members, um, other questions? And I apologize for being so long winded. I see Ms. Mack's hand first. Ms. Mack? I, uh, Mr. Tantliff, thank you very much. Um, I love this kind of stuff, as if anybody didn't know. Before I get into what you talked about, I, I have some burning questions of things that I've noticed. When I ride around and I see netting on the trees on school property, is that in this budget or is that in the school's budget, in the individual school's budget? Because this is a 17 year thing that we can't plan for. I mean, we can because it happens every 17 years, but who's paying for that? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. If facilities um, just has them and or, you know, the maintenance crew ha bought them and has them in stock or if some schools took their own initiative. I, I don't know that. I'm pretty what, kind of, what kind of netting are you referencing? You're talking about the, the, cicada for the cicadas. Netting oh. on the I have a lot of schools within walking distance and I see the netting and every time I walk by the school, I think, I wonder if that's coming out of the school budget. It's just a curiosity. And then my other question as a curiosity, my husband is a contractor. Wood has gone up by 30%. A, a two by four has gone up by 30%. I know when we have contracts, we have a 10% buffer in there, but within our contracted services, how do we allow for significant changes like a 30% increase in lumber? And I know we don't use a lot of lumber, but let's say it's a 30% increase in steel. What happens then? No, that, that's a great question and that's a new phenomenon. I, I want to take that back to the team. The, the one around uh, lumber is real. So, oh no, no, I know it's very real. Yeah. So <laughs> let me add, let me uh, let me circle back to Pete and and team um, to figure out. We'll use that as the example that we could then equate to any uh, potential material or resource which is in shortage. Okay, and then my other my question about the presentation, Mr. Tantliff, you said. Everything we underspend is given back to the county. And, but then we have bats and we just spent some time talking about bats. So when we have a bat and we're transferring money between categories, when we underspend, we're underspending overall or we're underspending at a category level? Um, well, the first thing is we, uh, absolutely positively will overall underspend the budget because George and I don't like striped suits and so just kidding but we, yeah. we're absolutely that's our number one we ensure we will not overspend the budget now be, there's things that come up and we end up overspending some categories and underspending other categories we know in aggregate we're going to come in significantly uh, under budget, but we can use the underspended categories to move dollars into the overspended categories, overspent categories. Um, we probably don't have time tonight, but you know we can look at the bat again next meeting with kind okay. of a new eye. But that's basically what we're doing is we're predicting how much do we need in each activity based on our known spending and new spending we'd like to do it year. And so when we did the bat, we also told the board, hey, we have a few million dollars of FY22 textbooks we want to buy in May if the bat gets approved. So that got taken into account and then we add a cushion. So like I said before, if we think we're going to be $100,000 under budget, we'll, we would probably move a million dollars into mm -hmm. that activity just because you know, especially the big activities have a lot of volatility and we just want to be super safe about it. And we know other categories where we're confident we're X millions under budget. And we so anytime we move from the categories, we're very, very confident um, and we do a very detailed projection and we're very confident that the underspent categories will be underspent and the overspent um, you know, will come within the back that we move into those dollars, into those categories. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, because I think we have two minutes left before our
six yeah. thirty meeting. I'm, I'll let Miss Pastor go in two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Ms. Mack. Well, and Mr. I also McMillian, saw Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian. Mr. McMillian was before me. Mr. McMillian put a comment but in the can chat. Can I just this throw mine out and you can just answer them in writing sometime because I really need somebody to work on these questions. Um, Mr. Mil McMillian, would you mind if I just throw out these questions? Absolutely not. All right, thank you. The first one is page five, number six, special education. This is something that not only have I always wondered and needed clar clarification on, but a lot of parents do as well. There seems to be a lot of um, um, fighting, of animal fighting, if you will, and I'm saying this in all transparency and honesty, that when I, I understand the money for um, non-public and how we pay for those non-publics, um, but there's always a wrangling of that so we can try to get parents or children not to need non-public, but when they do, they do, and we have to pay for it. Also about, um, I, I'm going to call that transportation. We spend an, a lot of money on taxis and all sorts of things, moving children hither and yon. I really would like that addressed in terms of what else we can do. We're, we're on that. We're on that. We're looking at some. Uh, there's the miniature buses. Um, that will be part of the presentation that we do in in, uh, in July. I'll make sure that they have that as part. But there's a couple additional uh, buses. The money that will be saved is so significant. Absolutely. I mean, it's. it's, it's, it's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. We've been out of control with that. Yeah. And the other piece with that is when an IEP team keeps testing and testing and testing a child, particularly in reading, and we still can't find the answers. Sometimes the answers go to things like, I'll just use uh, uh, vision, it goes to dyslexia, dysgraphia, any of those things. But our answer always is, we don't really do that, that's outside of the system, but it really isn't because ultimately we have to do those, um, um, the equipment, sometimes it's a laptop or whatever it is for those children. Um, so I understand the wrangling off, no, I don't understand the wrangling on it. It is what it is and these children need what they need. But I would just like to know from where, when we're looking at our budget, since I keep hearing that answer, oh, well, well, we don't really, blah, blah, blah. All right, at some point, who's paying for it? Because it's not being paid for out of the system. So where in the budget um, would we be plucking these needs and these services for our children? And then ultimately understanding that they're ours and we do have to pay for it. And the last thing, at some point in writing, if you could just tell me on page three, number one, it said the total uh, total expenditures and encumbrances. I'd just like to know what the consulting costs um, for upgrade of HR and financial accounting was. So if you can just put that in writing for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And if I didn't make sense on either of those, just send me an email and I'll try to fine tune what I was babbling there. Thank you, Ms. Pestier. And I also um, took notes and put those in the chat. So as Thanks. future topics or possibly written up, ri written responses and follow up to your questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. You're welcome. Mr. McMillian. These other, this other me meeting and we're two minutes late for that. So I'll just delay my questions. And oh, if, wow. if I get to it, I'll, I'll don't worry about it. If I get to it, I'll write it down. Okay. Thank you. Or you can ask next month. Mr. McMillian, do you want to um, state the topics and I'll note those in the no, chat so that I we don't. get back just to them? Let, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you all. You. And McMillian. again, my apologies. I get no question time next time. I, I'll defer to my <laughs> the committee. Okay. With that and seeing the time, um, the next meeting of the Budget Committee will be on June 16th, 2021. And there's no further business. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.
Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.